I see it in the presentation mode now, sir. Yes. You can change the uh, slides now, sir. You can just check, sir. You can click yeah. on the next slide. Now I'm going to be switching out of this quite a bit, sir, and uh, targeting the uh, probably live internet so that I can do by pressing escape buttons, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, well, you can, like, maybe if you're uh, presenting to any website, for example, in NSC or BSC. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in that case, you can just uh, uh, stop sharing this and then you can share your Google uh, window, sir. Uh, so, so I have, to, I have yeah. to share again or will it automatically you go? You have to share again. So automatically it won't take, sir. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Then you have to share again. You have to stop sharing this and then you have to click on the... Okay, so I'll stop sharing this. Yes, sir. And now I will... Now I do share screen. Yes, sir. Or window. Now where is the HTML coming? How do I share the? Uh, sir, uh, when the moment we click on share op uh, button, no, sir, there's a option share option, right? Click on the yeah. share. Uh, Google and window it's... will appear, sir. There. So Chrome, Chrome window will appear there. There itself. So Chrome window, and then you will get the other applications. So my thing is coming PPT Chrome tab that one, right? Yes, a Chrome tab, sir. Yes, a Chrome tab. Okay. Screen problem saying it's frozen or something. Uh, if you click on that uh, Google Chrome tab, no, sir. Yes, sir. It will be shared. I have shared, but it's uh, taking time, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's frozen. Should I re log in, sir? Yes, sir. You can do, sir. No problem, sir. You can uh, leave the meeting, sir. Yes. Uh, do not end, sir. This option will come. Leave the meeting. Cancel. Uh, once again, sir. Just. Yes, sir. Now you can leave and then you can reach uh, reach on later. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Yes.
Good afternoon, sir. Your video is also perfect now, sir. You're visible. So you can unmute, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, audio audio and video both are perfect, sir. Okay, fantastic. And let me just try the sharing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The NSC. So sharing, or you can see either on the top or maybe in the bottom of the middle, you can find the options there, sir. In the top, okay, you can sir. find a share tab. Under that, yeah. share content, share web browser. So the this, uh, yes. So this, uh, you can see the screen now, right, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, it's visible, sir. Visible, sir. Okay. And uh, same way, I I have to stop this to give a new share, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right, maybe you can just uh, share content also, sir. Okay. Okay. Click on share content. Okay. So of the PowerPoint presentation can be selected first. Uh, this uh, sharing it. Okay. Okay, so now you are seeing my prior screen only? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Webex is a bit new to me. I'm not used to it, so sorry. Isn't it? No problem. Uh, how do I maximize the screen? And if I want to share the thing, it disappeared. Uh, so now you are there in the, that blogspot. That no, sir. Your market waves in that page. Yes. That, that is visible. Yeah. Now, how do I go back and share my PPT? The screen has suddenly uh, become. Click on, uh, stop sharing, sir. No, that uh, screen option has disappeared somewhere. It's become a small. How do I maximize that, sir? Uh, uh, you're asking uh, the content you're, you want to maximize, sir, or? No, I there was a screen where it said share and all that is not there anymore. No, you click just you click on the screen. Uh, it will appear, sir. Just click, click on You are sharing, it's saying. Oh, I should say stop share. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Stop share. Okay. Yeah, you stop sharing now, sir. Content to stop sharing. Again, you okay. can uh, click on share. Okay. Yeah, done. Done. Okay, sir. Done. Now you can see my uh, screen, yes, sir. Right? The PowerPoint is visible, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Done. Okay, I see the screen options are moved to the top. Okay, I'll just shift it to the bottom. Okay, sir. Okay. Done, sir. We can start, yes, sir. Everybody yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, can I uh, have uh, the students divided? How many students are there, sir, participating? 
Uh, so total uh, 288 students, sir. Uh, okay. I 242 are there. I think they are joining. The number is increasing now. So we'll start the session, so no problem. Uh, okay. Ashita? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can start. Yes, thank you, sir. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. Yesterday, I came across a beautiful quote which said, an individual should act consistently like an investor and not a speculator. On this note, I, I, Ashita Bagi, would like to, you know, express my warm welcome to Dean Dr. Jane Matthew, Dean DJ Campus Dr. Jyoti Kumar, HOS Dr. Marina Matthew, HOD Dr. Joby Thomas, and MBA Coordinator BGR Campus Dr. Rashmi Rai, and all the team's faculties and my fellow classmates. Without any delay, I would like to call Sandhya to introduce our resource person for today's session, Professor Rajveer Samuel. Over to you, Sandhya. Thank you, Ashita. Uh, thank you, sir, for your valuable time. Rajveer R is a dynamic professional with over 21 years of experience covering the following areas in teaching, student mentoring, research, risk management, hedge accounting, corporate training, investment advisory, portfolio management, and asset management. His areas of expertise are usually in financial research and analysis and the use of key statistical packages like SPSS and GRETL. He has had uh, uh, key trainings undertaken in entrepreneurship finance, a corporate training, valuation modeling, developing business plans, faculty development program on teaching business processes through case studies through IIT Madras. Also, FDP on social science research using SPSS and AMOS from RV Institute of Management, Bangalore. He is currently pursuing his PhD from Bharatichar University, Coimbatore. He is an MBA finance from uh, Cardiff Metropolitan University's Wales from United Kingdom. And he has completed his B.Tech from Chemical Engineering from National Institute of Technology, Trichy. Some of his career highlights are he has been a visiting professor, assistant professor, associate professor, and a senior lecturer. He has also been a financial analyst at the asset management for Kevin Care, Chennai. He has also been the account manager at Wariman Capital Markets, Chennai. Thank you, sir, for your valuable time, and we look forward to an interesting session. Over to you, Ashita. Thank you, Sandhya, for that wonderful introduction. Now, I request Professor to take over. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, just a small correction. I did complete my PhD two years ago. So I think uh, in the profile I had given you, I may not have updated it or something. But anyway, uh, I uh, just to add to what you guys said, my experience has been in the capital markets domain, and I have a passion on uh, understanding how inter-market relationships work. So current research is looking at how the stock market uh, moves in tandem with several asset classes. And the current period is very, very interesting. You've, you've seen some very, very big moves in asset class. May I ask uh, how many of you students trade approximately? Let me, let me see. You can put your hands up maybe or somewhere so I can see. Are you trading the market? Any of you can just say if you are students, any of you trade the market? I'm sure some of you do. Oh, yes, I see many hands. Yeah. Okay. So what is your goal uh, in trading? What, what are you trying to do? You can speak up. This section uh, is going to be an interactive session. So I would uh, very much want you to interact and question and uh, have a mutual discussion on this. This is not a class. This I, I have uh, my goal for the session is to kind of make better traders slash investors. So why do you trade? Go ahead. I can't hear you guys for some reason. Uh, Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, you are, you are, yeah. 
like to be francs or to make profit. Okay, to make profit, yes. Anybody else? Uh, guys, you can else? unmute and you can respond. Yeah. So to learn more about it and to book profit, obviously. Okay, so to learn more about the markets and book profits, yes? Yes? What else? Anybody else? Good afternoon, sir. So, sir, to, yes. to uh, understand if, you know, like the analysis, what has been done, like, you know, the, the theory which we learn, putting it to practical use and relate it and, of course, make profit out of the same. Yes. yes. Okay, learning and making profits. Yeah, good, good goals. Yeah. Anybody else? So it's a, it can be used as a part of an income. Okay, income-based strategies. So if you're looking at income, okay, trading to make a regular income. Yeah, there are many guys who do that. Yeah. Yes, to uh, beat the inflation. To beat inflation. Very good. Excellent. Anybody else? Okay, now let me just ask you something in extension. Sir, can you put an end to the beeps, sir? Some beeps are coming. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will do so. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, so what is considered, those guys who are trading and those guys who are not, what do you consider as a good return? Give me a percentage. Good yearly return. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, go ahead. But it depends upon uh, like uh, where we are trading, whether it's equity or FNO. Uh, Absolutely your... right. But to you, if you want to go home satisfied, what is the kind of annual return would you do? Sir, if you are doing an FNO, then 50 to 60 per percent. Oh, that's uh, FNO is kind of gambling, right? Very, very difficult to <laughs> buy and sell yeah, if options if and I, make money. You get wiped I, out more often than you make money. So if you take all your losses, gains, etc., what would your net return be? 60% is way too much. That's way good. If you can do 60%, I'll sell everything I've got and give it to you. Okay. But good if you can do that kind of return consistently. Anybody else? Sir, 25% would be a good return, I believe. That's very good as well. I, I'd still give you all my money if you can guarantee me 25%. That's very good as well. So now let's let's just step one step forward here and look at what the bank gives you. Today, if you put your money in the bank, what do you go get? One year return. 3.5%, sir. So the maximum you'll get is 4%. Yes. So if you go to the RBI website and look at one year. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. One of you was going to say something. Yes. Okay, so the maximum you're going to look at is 4% on an FD, right? In fact, the risk-free rate of the return on one-year government bonds today, if you go on the RPA website, you'll see that as 3.5%. So about half percent more you'll get in your fixed uh, deposits for one year. 4%, is that a good return? No, sir. Why is that not a good return? So because it's lesser than inflation rate. Correct. And what is the inflation rate? It's 6%, nearly 6%. Yeah, 5.5% nearly. So you can't beat inflation by keeping your money in six deposits. So where else can you park the money? What do you think? What about real estate? 
yes, real estate also and equity is also a good option. But real estate, can you buy and sell real estate anytime you want? No, sir. Yeah, because the liquidity element is there, right? Yeah, your uh, real estate, you can't just turn over like a stock in your DMAT account, right? Now, the government has introduced something called real estate investment trusts, which trade on the exchange that you can buy and sell. So to an extent, it may be possible. Yes, real estate investment trusts, you can buy and sell them as stocks. So real estate is one option. What else? What about gold? What do you think of that? So gold is good as an investment, may give you, let's say, 6 to 7%, 8% on an average. You will beat inflation, particularly in periods of high inflation, gold tends to get a bit to it, right? But 7 to 8% is all you can reasonably expect in a year from gold. So then what is the next best thing? Common stock. So how much has the Sensex and Nifty returned since inception? Yes, students? It's around 14 to 15%. Actually, you'll be surprised it's not that high. In 1978, the Sensex was 100. Where is it today? It's almost 560 times. Yeah, so uh, 60,000 is where it is today. Yeah. But if you look at that period from 78 to 21, 43 year period, when you average it, the return works out to 14 to 15%. Yes, not more than that. But still, you've been able to beat inflation in several of those years from 43 years. So, Consistently beating inflation is something we want. So that's why we turn to investing in stuff. What about Nifty? In 1993, when Nifty started, anybody knows what the starting value of Nifty was? About, yeah, go ahead. Students, anyone? 1,000 was the starting value. And where is the Nifty today? Nearly 17,700 the last time I checked before this class. Right? So again, 14 to 15% consistently, you get returns only in the stock market. So remember, an investment has to beat inflation, inflation not one year, two years, but consistently over time. And today, if you look at the great investors of our time, who do you think are our great investors? Some examples? So Rakesh, Junjunwala, Baron Buffet. No. Yeah. Rakesh, Junjunwala, Warren Buffet. What kind of investors these guys are? Are they doing intraday trading? Value investors. Value investors, long investor, long term investors. So Warren Buffett, according to Warren Buffett, what is long term? Which can we don't sell after 50 years also? Yes. Lifetime. So ten, typically 10 or more years is how Warren Buffett def uh, def defines long term. So you've heard of great investors, but have you heard of any great intraday traders? No, yes, sir. You wouldn't have heard of any great intraday trader. What is that? Because 87% of intraday traders are losing money. It is proven and stat. Right? 87%, not 1, 2, 3, 20, 25, even 50%. 87% of uh, intraday traders are losing money. So you better uh, you're better off when you give yourself time. And what on what basis are uh, Rakesh Junjunwala and Warren Buffett investing? Yeah. 
Any idea, students? So by doing analysis. Based on value of my company. So they do the first of what you see on your screen, fundamental analysis. Okay. So they analyze the company and try to find its value. Once they find it, find its value, they see if it is at a discount. So one of Warren Buffett's famous tenants, buy a bis uh, business at a discount and forget about it. Don't worry about the stock market. Don't worry about the economy. Diversify. Buy a business at a discount. So how can you buy a business at a discount? Unless you know the fundamental value of it, you cannot, right? So hence, I know uh, a lot of Indian market participants focus on the graph, but you go nowhere with the graph unless there is a fundamental reason for buying it. So what I want you to take away from this is, please uh, have a fundamental reason for making an investment. Always, always have a fundamental reason for making an investment. Then use the graph to look at the entry or exit for that investment. If you manage that, then your chances of success in the market are very, very high. So that's what we are going to look at. Okay. All right. So now um, you all know about the financial markets. What are the different types of financial markets that are out there, students? You are fourth semester students or third semester? Fourth trimester, sir. Fourth trimester. So you are in the last, is that the last semester? Or two more are there or something. The trimester system is uh, two more, not familiar. So two more are there. Okay. okay. So by now you would have come across different uh, financial markets. Yes, sir. Yes, you would have come across many markets. Yeah. What are some markets you know? Financial some forest markets. market. State market. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So you already touched on it. What is the biggest market in the world? Forex, sir. Forex market. Yeah, Forex. It is, in fact, bigger than all stock and bond markets in the world put together. And it trades 24 7. In fact, for technical analysis, you can look at the Forex market. We will, at some point of time during this course, look at that for technical analysis. So in general, if you look, uh, financial markets can be many fold. Yes, you can have the money market. You can have the stock market. Our focus is going to be in the secondary market. Yes, because we are looking at uh, the stock market, but you can have short term investments, money market, stock market, and you can even have these chit funds in the unorganized segment. Yes. Um, yes. And you can have all the participants who are there. Okay. Now, what is the advantage you guys think of having a financial market? Why are companies listing? their stocks on the stock market. So one of the things, the primary, yeah, that's, that's correct. Raise money. Yes. So raise money effectively, cheaply from a large number of participants. Yes. And ultimately you would have probably seen in the last three months. Can you tell me how many IPOs have come in the last three months? At least 25. Around 20. Yeah. Around yeah, 20. so many. Right? So why are they coming now? You didn't see them come six months ago, this many. What is making them come to the market now? Yeah, so the record bullishness, which has pushed share prices up significantly. In fact, since the COVID lows, the markets have doubled, more than doubled. 150%, the Nifty alone has gone up. Yes, 130, 140%. So when prices are high, companies want to lock in and come to the market. Yes, 
So raising capital, uh, when the valuations are high, is a good thing for companies. Maybe not as good for you because you are buying when somebody else is selling at a high price, right? But that's why the stock market is so important. The secondary market's performance will dictate value creation in the primary market. How can when will companies come to the market? The stock market is doing well. They didn't come when COVID was happening, did they? When share prices were plunging, right? So this is another takeaway for you is that financial markets facilitate price discovery. Yes. And we and you guys me all the markets and the forex market is by far the biggest several trillion dollars worth of uh, currencies. So in India, we have the BSC and the NSC. I'll just quickly uh, summarize them for you. Now, let me ask you this. Which exchange is doing well here? BSC or NSC? Both are doing well, but the NSC is Why is that? New technology. So NSC was the first one to computerize everything. So as a result, the broker dealers have all connected to NSC and they just don't bother about the BSC much, right? So I'll show you some interesting things. On any given day, you take any particular stock, right? Um, so let us look at moneycontrol.com. And let us look at Infosys, for example. Okay, so what do you see there? So we can't I, have, see I think you have to share the content, sir. Oh, I have not. You can't see my screen. Okay, I'll share. Is that shared now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you see Infosys's price? Yes, it's visible, sir. Yeah, there you go. So normally there's a breakup of uh, NSE and BSE volumes. Okay, let us see. Okay, so so before uh, you see that volume there. What do you see there? You see the volume. Yes, it's almost 19 lakh shares worth of volume. Yes. Yes. And look at uh, what I want you to take away from us. Look at that 52 week high and the 52 week low. Can you see that students? So, yes. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the 52 week high is 1788. Yes. And the 52 week low happened during the COVID period, right? 1011. Yes. So this is Infosys case. The, the value changing hand is in lakhs is 33,000 lakhs almost. So if you look, 1 trillion worth of Infosys stock is traded on one day. Now, NSE, I was telling you, trades much more volume than the BSE. Okay. So normally the BSE price is also visible, the volume traded. But take from me that the BSE volume, if you look, is often almost one-tenth or one-seventh of the NSE volume. So money control has now stopped quoting the BSE volume at all because it is so less compared to the NSE volume. Yes. So BSE initially was India's first exchange. Then NSE came into picture to increase awareness of the markets and they connected everything up. And increasingly, NSE has become popular for one more thing. What is that? 
Anybody know? NSC is the world's largest what? Anyone students? It's the world's largest derivative exchange. Has become. So what has caused them to become the world's largest derivative exchange? Yes? Any idea? So they introduced lot of derivative contracts, not only on monthly expiry, but also weekly expiry. Yes, some of you may trade options. Be very careful if you do that. Yes. So NSE, yes, uh, has become, there you see it, the world's number one derivative exchange in the world 220. Can you see that screen, students, with a statistic? Yes. Yes, no? Visible, sir. Yeah, okay. So, uh, NSE is the world's largest derivative exchange. And NSE computes the famous Nifty index. Yes? So, by the way, students, why do we need a stock market index? You know the indices, right? Sensex, Nifty. Yeah. So why we need a stock market index? So if the index is moving up, then we think that the economy is doing well of a particular. Okay, so, so many people think that the stock market is a barometer of economic performance. Yes. So if you look. The stock market started crashing when COVID came, but started recovering even when the COVID the cases were increasing, right? Yes? So, what is that telling you? Many people feel their tests look at the stock market as a leading barometer. When the stock market recovers without the economy, it means the economic recovery is coming. And recently, you saw that the economic recovery is happening now. Yes, students? So the economic recovery actually happened after the stock market recovery, right? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yeah. So the stock market is often viewed as a leading indicator. And an index, stock market index should be diversified. Okay. It cannot just represent one or two sectors. Any idea of how many sectors are in the Nifty index? Over 20, over 20 actually. So let's have a look. Yes. So this is your Nifty. Uh, let us look at uh, NSE indices. So today, there are 12, 38 advances, 12 decliners, 38 stocks are up. Market breadth is very good. Let's look at... Uh, Click that. Okay. So today, if you look, the stocks that are leading are on the left side. Divi's Labs, if you look, is up the most today. And what about stocks? There are still stocks that are losing money today. Cipla is down, Grasm is down. So on any given day, stocks will be up or down. But if the overall trend is up, yes, then we can be very happy. So let's look at uh, Stockwatch. I want to see all the companies in the Nifty. Okay. Okay, so these are the companies in the Nifty index. So Divi's Labs, which sector is that, students? 
pharma yeah that's pharma ntpc our generation correct and so on and so forth bajaj fin service financials so you can see the broad range of sectors that are given and represented in the nifty yes you can keep going down so you have financial financial services pharma technology yes and so on and so forth but you can see it's very broad oil energy painting cement fmcg you name it yeah okay so now please understand another reason for having a stock market index yes anybody can think of another reason Another reason for having a stock market index. Any of you can think? Okay, one is we can track the performance of the economy by looking at a diversified index. Okay, anything else we can look at? What about benchmarking performance? How do I know if my stock market, if my individual stocks return is good or not? What do I compare it? I need a benchmark, right? So hence, the Nifty is a benchmark. So I can benchmark, yes, any company's performance against the Nifty index and see if I'm beating the Nifty index or not. In fact, mutual fund managers, you all are, you are all knowing about mutual fund students? You would have heard them, heard about mutual funds? Yeah. So what are they? They are investing in a bunch of stocks. So at the end of each year, mutual fund performance is benchmarked against the Nifty. So if my fund manager is not beating the Nifty, then my fund is not doing well. My fund manager will say, I made 25%. Hey, but the Nifty went up 30%. So you've not beat the market. See you later. No bonus for you. That's how the industry works on benchmarking against performance. So hence, very, 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 very important, right? Any questions, students? Now the NSE is a very interesting exchange. Please understand, the NSE not only lists stocks, but it lists sovereign bonds. Then there's an asset class called exchange traded funds. Anybody know what an exchange traded fund is? What if you decide? I don't want to buy individual stocks because I don't know which stock will go up, which stock will go down. Instead, what do I want to do? I want to buy the Nifty as a whole. So there are some funds that are traded, mutual funds that track individual indices that are traded on the NSC. Yes, have a look at some of these. You don't have, uh, you do not have individual uh, indices alone, Nifty tracking uh, ETFs alone, you have so many indices. You have a PSU bank index. If you want to invest only in PSU banks, but you don't know which bank you want to invest in a bunch of them, then you can buy the PSU bank piece. Yes, if you want to invest in private banks alone, but you don't know which individually you want an index, you have that. You can invest in the Nifty 50 as a whole. Yes. Then there's something called the Nifty Next 50. The next 50 large companies that are traded, which are not in the Nifty index, right? Let's say you want to take a bit more risk. You want mid cap. You can invest in the mid cap one. Let's say you, you don't want to take risk. You feel the economy is going to uh, come down. You want to play defense. Then maybe FMCG is for you. Nifty Healthcare maybe. Then if you want to... Invest in utility-based companies, CPSE, your public utilities, and uh, PSU companies together, right? Then Bank Nifty, 
So, so many things. In fact, there is even a NASDAQ ETF you can invest here. So, you don't want to take the risk of opening an account in US and investing in the NASDAQ. You can invest in NASDAQ ETF here. So, so many options are there for you to invest. Yes? Okay. Now, let's switch gears, students. Let me ask you a question here. Um, why did the stock market triple from the lows? Yes, anybody has an explanation? Sir, in increased uh, liquidity infusion. Definitely liquidity was one, but how did that liquidity come about? Uh, low interest rates and very very much true low interest rates how did low interest rates come about going one step further uh, they wanted to boost the consumer demand so they yes but how did uh, the central banks action globally bring about low interest rates So the central banks globally, when they saw COVID happen and everything go for a toss, they decided to buy a lot of assets. Okay. So their criteria for getting the economy out of trouble was to buy a lot of assets. And what type of assets? RBI has been buying its own bonds. You are aware of that? India's own bonds, long-term bonds, RBI has been buying it's called and they called it operation twist at that time they are still continuing with their buy, bond buying so what has that done so as you know when bonds are bought bond prices go up and you all know from your basic uh, bond uh, classes that bond prices and interest rates move in opposite direction so interest rates come down right so can we keep doing that though? Yes. Can we keep doing that? Forever? Yeah, so the problem is this. You can get interest rates as low as possible. Some countries in the world, like Japan and the Eurozone, have interest rates negative. You are aware of that? Yes, which means you have to pay the bank to take your money. Right. So, you can't go much below that, can you? So, in Japan, please note, the government had kept interest rates negative for almost 25 years. And the stock market is below where it was in 1989. Okay. In America, we have kept interest rates in the last 10 years, close to zero. The stock market is at an all-time high, but who knows when something like Japan will happen. Europe, same case. Interest rates, negative. Yes. Switzerland, interest rates, negative. So, what are central banks trying to do by keeping interest rates negative? They say, don't put your money in the bank, take it out and spend. But you think that works? In Japan, people started keeping their money in socks. S-O-C-K-S, socks. Okay. Because they don't want, their, they wanted their money to be safe. Rightfully so. The stock market has still not recovered. If it can happen in Japan, it can happen anywhere. China. Take China's example. China's economy has completely slowed down in the last 10, 11 years. The stock market is half of what it was in 2008. So, should we learn from all of these things? And at some point, every time the stock market doubles or goes higher, often risks get mispriced. Okay? So, the stock market is obviously not expecting another recession. But if you are a follower of market cycles, yes, if you are a follower of market cycles, you will see that every 10 years there is a minor recession. 2008, we had one. Yes, 2021. And every 40 to 60 years, there's a depression. 
And the difference between a recession and a depression is what, students? Any idea? In a recession, companies may disappear, but in a depression, industries disappear. So in the 1929 Great Depression, there were supposedly over 5,000 car companies. How many of them are left, do you think? You could count them with your hand now today, right? Maybe 25 companies are left globally. So these uh, disturbances in the market can happen. So can you anticipate that? That is something uh, uh, that you have to keep in mind. Investing is great, but investing without risk management can be very terrible. Because when a recession or anything comes, you can lose six, seven, eight years worth of returns just like that. Yes? In 2008, classic example, market was at uh, 63.50 in January. And because of the recessionary disturbances from that, it went to 2250. 60% of the value was lost. So my point is this, investing is a long-term exercise. When you should have money to invest when the market crashes, right? Over the long run, stock markets always go up. No doubt in my mind. But in a short run period, like what you are seeing now, when risks are a bit out of hand, I would say, yes, then you can have some disturbances. So how are you managing your risk? Very, very important. The second important point, return is one thing, but return has risk associated with it. And no matter whether you are trading or whether you are investing, Yes, you must be aware of the risk and it is all about risk reward. The higher the risk reward, better your returns. Okay, all right. Any questions, students, on what was discussed? So continuing one more thing. So central banks purchased bonds, kept interest rates low. So what did that lead to? It led to the fact that interest expense of most companies came down. If interest expense comes down, profitability goes up and share prices go up. So this strategy works. Yes, but for how long? Yes, you should ask for how long. So this Friday, the RBI is going to meet. It will be very interesting to see what they are going to say about their bond purchases. Today, the Federal Reserve in the recent meeting said they may have to cut down on their bond purchases. Today, globally, central banks have been buying. Okay over $12 trillion worth of assets. And this is not just bonds. The U.S. Federal Reserve bought mortgage-backed securities. What is a mortgage-backed security, anybody? Bonds that are backed by mortgages. Yes, loans lent to the housing segment. So that way, housing loans also, interest rates came very low. Yes. Uh, they even bought junk bonds. Students, you heard what junk bonds are? Anyone? So junk bonds are uh, bonds issued by companies of questionable credit. Credit rating C plus C minus D, E, that kind of a thing. So the Federal Reserve came and bought all kinds of bonds and as a result, interest rates came down. But if you look what has been happening in the bond market in the US, since the last federal uh, FOMC meeting ended two weeks ago, bond prices have suddenly started falling and interest rates going up. Now, why is this important? If interest rates go up, then once again, we have money will go out of risky assets such as stocks and invest in safer instruments like bonds. So there will be asset allocation, reallocation, out of risky investments into risk-free investments. So hence, when you are an investor, you must be aware, yes, of uh, all the, not only the return potential of what you're doing, 
but also the risk associated. Okay, students, any questions before I proceed further? Any questions? Yes, no? Okay. Now let us touch on another important element. How does pricing work? How does pricing on the stock market happen actually? So let's look at again Infosys, for example. Yeah. So here we go. Now, can you see this order book of emphasis? Is that visible to you, students? Yes, no? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you can see bid quantity as quantity, yes? So bid is eight and uh, ask is 225. So bid, you can treat bid as the buyers and ask as the sellers, yes? If sellers are more, price will come down. Remember it's supply demand. Share prices are totally determined by supply demand dynamics. Nothing more, nothing less. Yes. So in this case, seems like there are more sellers. Is the price up or down today? Price is up slightly, but in the last, uh, if you look, the next traded price, what do you think will the next traded price be? Let's look at it. 1679 we are seeing. Today it is up on the day. Yes. So given that there are more sellers, it is very possible that the next traded price on Infosys could be down. Yes, could be down. If you see a minute by minute chart, you can see this. Let me just show you this. Yeah, it was 1679.40. Now it has come to 1679.05, right? Do you see that students? Yes. So when there are more sellers than buyers, prices go down. Very simple. Supply demand logistics. Okay. Now look at the total market cap. Yes. Look at the total market capitalization of emphasis. Yeah, seven lakh crore. Merely. 7 trillion rupees is the market capitalization. Is that right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah, nearly 7 trillion rupees. And there is something called uh, free float market capitalization. Yes? What is that, students? Anybody? Any of you know what that is? Okay, that is just the traded shares. So, free float market capitalization is the traded shares. What about the remainder then? So, 6 trillion shares out of 7 trillion shares are traded. What about the rest? 1 trillion shares are there, right? What about that? Um, sir, they are putting it in the chat box as promoters and then. Oh, I, I, can't, I don't see the chat. Oh, there's a chat icon here somewhere. Yes, uh, I, I missed the chat. For some reason, I don't see the chat. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so the remaining uh, one uh, trillion shares is promoter held usually, yes. So now when you... Compute the stock market exchange, uh, the index, 
you will not consider the whole traded value. You will consider only the free float market capitalization. Okay. So for all the stocks, okay, if we get this free float market capitalization, add them up, divide by the free float market capitalization we had in 1993 when the Nifty was traded first and multiply by the starting value 1000, you will get today's value of the list. Yes, so we will take free float market capitalization of all our companies, 50 companies, add them up, divide by the first day's free float market capitalization in back in 1993 and multiply by 1000, which was the first traded value, we should get today's value of the nifty okay so that's how the stock market index is computed any questions students uh, there is something on the right hand side called uh, security var you see that students You may learn that in risk management, so I'm not going to touch much about that. It's just a risk management measure. It's uh, It tells you how much the security can drop. So usually with the VAR, they will have a confidence level also. So the five-day 95% VAR, VAR stands for value at risk. So if it is a five-day 95% VAR, and that is 10.63, what does it mean? It simply means that in the next five days, I'm 95% sure that Infosys won't drop by more than 10.63%. Okay. The next five days, I'm 95% sure that Infosys won't drop below 10.63%. But guess what? 5% of the time, it can still happen. Right? COVID was an example. Yes, during COVID, this thing happened. Okay. Any other questions, students? On anything discussed? Okay. All right. So as I uh, told you, the NSC is the preferred exchange of choice. So this is the reason why. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes? Okay. So uh, NSC has definitely made the uh, stock market widely acceptable to the Indian public. Screen-based trading, like what you saw, bid, ask right in front of you, yeah. Very transparent transaction. One of the problems with BSC, BSC was at the early part of this year, uh, 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 1980s, 1990s is when uh, the BSC was there, the single exchange. At that time, unfortunately, the stock market was not well regulated. SEBI came only in 1992. So a lot of scams happened on the BSC. Okay, so um, so people were a little shaken up. So transactions were not transparent. Yes, matching of orders was not clear. And then settlement was not done properly. Today, a lot of things have changed since SEBI came, NSE came. Uh, settlement cycle, eh, eh, all of you know what the state settlement cycle is? Any of you know? That NSC follows? T plus two. Yeah, T plus two, which means what? If I buy a share today, within two days, it should business days, working days, it should come into my account. Now SEBI is saying, make it T plus one. 
okay so so very 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 uh, transparent there is a clearing company that has been uh, established by nsc to make sure settlement happens in a very timely fashion yes and as a result brokerages have reduced cost today you can trade stocks for free on many brokerages yes uh, more liquidity has come and then also they guarantee settlement right if you bought a trade the trade is on it and they have a clearing company and they quickly clear and settle bonds currencies recently rupee trading in 2014 came about on the nsc so currency trading uh, currency hedging all those things can happen on the nsc itself bonds sovereign gold bonds the bonds of some companies are listed on the nsc as well so nsc has become much more broad ranged and wider widely used so the company that performs the nsc has something called nsdl you would be aware of it so nsdl is the clearing company so all trades are settled so when you go everything is in dmat form nowadays and nsdl overseas and does that right okay so you all know what dmat and remat is so today everything happens in dmat form yes so everything is in electronic form yes um and i also told you about all these indices so as as you you probably widely heard in the news that sensex and nifty are the major indices what is the difference between sensex and nifty students so sensex comprises the 50 top companies list and uh, nifty uh, opposite sensex comprises 30 top companies list and nifty is 50 yeah very true so the indices can be different from each other yes in terms of how many stocks are there what is the weightage of each stock yes so all these things can change in an index yes um, so index yes as you guys rightfully said uh, sensex is uh, 30 companies nifty is 50 largest companies so what what how how do these companies get in the sensex or nifty any idea So this is how they differ, number of stocks, composition, weighted. And by the way, there's something called a base year. So base year is usually the first year when everything started. 1978, I think for Sensex, we we'll look at that in a minute. And 1993 for Nifty. Yes. So for each index, the base year is different and the starting price is also different. So hence, the value of the indices is different. Yes. Sensex is close to 60,000 and Nifty is close to 17,700 because of this. Though 30 stocks are common to both of those indices, there are still 20 more stocks in the Nifty. So more number of stocks there. And the weightages are different. The composition is also different. And then the base year is different. So as a result, the value of the indices is different. Yes. Any questions, students? Further questions? Okay, so I, I asked you this question. How are we putting stocks in the Sensex or Nifty? First of all, it has to have a very good industry representation. I showed you the Nifty, right? 20 different industries, sectors. Yes, wide industry representation. Only the best companies in the industry. Yes, track record of profitability and dividend history. Yes. How easy to buy and sell? Liquid, is, are these companies highly liquid? Easy to buy or not? Uh, so I showed you that Infosys trading volume, almost a trillion it was, right? Over a trillion shares traded. So highly liquid. And market capitalization, only the largest companies can get to the indices like the Sensex and Nifty. Okay. So large companies, liquid companies, 
and the leaders in each segment are the ones that are allowed in Sensex and Nifty. Okay, so I already told you about this free float factor. So what is the free float uh, concept? Only traded shares. Okay, only traded shares are allowed uh, is uh, used for computing the index. So traded market capitalization is also called free float. Right, so free float market capitalization is what is allowed. So once you get the free float of every company in the Nifty or Sensex, you add it all up, and as I said, divide it by that free float capitalization on the first day when these ex indices were around, which was in 1978 for Nifty, I believe, and 1993 for Sensex uh, for Nifty, and then multiply by that first traded price, you get the indices. Okay. So, so quick refresher exercise for you, yes, to make you understand the, the you guys know about uh, this, you've studied this already, if, no, if so, I'll skip it, otherwise I'll just quickly walk you through a sample calculation as to how this free float is used. Have you come across this, students? You are knowing how indices are computed? Yes? Yes, no? Okay, since uh, many of you have said no, I will show you a, a, a very uh, small case where um, we are going to take three companies where we know the free float factors, the beginning, the ending, and then we are going to use Compute this index, knowing that the starting value was 100. So what is the value of the index at the end of the year? So what you see students there is your beginning price. Yes. Your beginning price, number of shares. Yes. Free float factor. So when you, how do you calculate market capitalization? How do I cal how do we calculate market capitalization? Share yes, price into the price of the, the number of shares. Okay. Correct. So number of shares into the share price would be the market capitalization. Correct. Most of you have said that. And if you multiply that by the free float factor before. Uh, about two, three years back, NSE was only publishing free float factors. Now they publish the free float market capitalization directly, as you saw. Yes, as you saw with the Infosys case. Yeah. Um, you, you can calculate the free float market capitalization of each company. Yes. So we want to calculate the free float ca market capitalization at the beginning, at the end. So end divided by beginning multiplied by the starting value of the index should give you the value of the index. So I'll just walk you through this just for your benefit so you understand how this computation happens. If you see this, then you will understand how Nifty is computed from 50 different companies. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. So please do these calculations, students. Quickly, you can do it. Uh, I initially wanted to make many groups uh, of students in groups of 15 each so you can do it together because a lot of group activity I've planned. So you can do that uh, among yourselves in case uh, group of 10 or 15 would be ideal. So if you can, we won't waste time here making groups, but at the end of the day, maybe you can make yourself some groups. Then we can do it in group. So, so very simple. We'll calculate our beginning free float ca market capitalization. Yes. And we will add it up. We will calculate our ending free float capitalization. So how, how do I cap, uh, calculate my free float market capitalization? Very simple, market capitalization into the free float factor, beginning and end. Yes, students? So if you do that, uh, you will get two different values. So the end market capitalization, free float, total. Remember, we want total, okay? Divided by the beginning free float market capitalization into that 100, which was the beginning value of the index, should give us the value of the index. Please don't worry about doing any numericals or anything. Now, students, I'm just doing this for your uh, 
understanding and I will share this material with you. Yes. So no need to worry. Uh, but I just want to give you an idea so you understand how this works. So for Nifty, for example, we will do 50 companies, right? We will take all their free float market capitalizations and do the same thing. Add it all up, divide by beginning free float market capitalization. And then multiply by the beginning value of the index. So obviously we can't be doing that manually. Computers do that. Yes, students? Any questions? Am I going too fast, too slow? Yes. Should I go slower? Is this correct pace? It's, it's fine. fine. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Great. Great. Okay. So now applying the same concept to Sensex and Nifty. This is how we calculate. This is how computers compute the Nifty and the census. Value. Yes. So index value 1978-79 was 100 for census. Yes. And market value. Uh, sum of free float factors, you have to compute that we will compute the bracket. Yes. Sum of free float capitalization, we have to compute now. Divided by the market value in 19, or the, the denominator should be the free market value, free float market value in 1978. Divided by the free float market value in 1995. That the index exchanges have that information. You get that and you apply the formula. Then you can calculate Sensex and Nifty. So remember, if you want to manually do that in an Excel sheet, it will take ages because there are 30 companies in Sensex and 50 companies in the Nifty index. Yeah. Any questions or any points you want to make? So this is just giving you some basic information. Okay, now Sensex and Nifty, as you know, are not the only indices. There is a broader index which takes into account the 500 largest stocks on the uh, exchanges. It's called the CNX 500. So if somebody wants a broader benchmark, yes, and they say 50 is not good enough, we want a 500 stock index, then you can look at CNX 500. There are mid cap indices, we already saw them on the exchanges, yes. Yeah. And there are ETFs, which I also showed. So, so basically that's the whole uh, uh, part about stock market indices. Okay. So I was asking you about investment and investment returns and all that. Yes. Um, you must differentiate investment from speculation. This is very, very important. So speculation is happening in a very, very short time horizon. Yes, there have been illustrators of great spec illustrations of great speculators. Can you give me an example? You already gave me investors example. How about speculators example? You don't hear too many of them. Many times speculators you hear in bad light, they blew up the bank, etc. Have you heard of any speculators who have done very well? Arshad Mehta, yes, he was doing, ultimately, he, he, he caused a crash, right? Yeah, speculator, speculation often ends badly more than it uh, uh, ends good. So there was a lot of malpractice that was happening. Ketan Parikh was another one. But globally, there was one gentleman who made several billion dollars betting against the pound. Anybody know who that was some 20 years, 30 years ago? Pound is a currency. So this gentleman made several billion dollars betting that the pound would decline in value. So this is a gentleman named George Soros. He also is one of the good investors also. His funds returned very, very well, beaten the market several years in a row. 
but he was known for speculation. But other than that, speculators have caused a lot of financial accidents. Have you heard of the story of Bering's Bank? Please look up Nick Leeson. He was a very famous speculator who ended up breaking <laughs> with a few trades, option derivatives trades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rohani, the one who has book also on that. Yeah. So, Bering's Bank, with few trades of his, he entirely destroyed an entire bank by concealing losses, almost $2 billion worth of loss back in the early 90s. So, and he went to jail, of course. More recently, there have been other illustrations of traders. There was a trader in J.P. Morgan recently who had blown about $2 billion. $2 billion is nothing these days, but back in the day, it was uh, an entire bank's capital for that matter. Yes. So, so, yes. So, one thing that you should understand is where investors, uh, investors like Warren Buffett and Junjunwala dominate is this risk reward yes so speculators do not keep losing money because their time period is very short they take too high risk yes and they don't analyze their investments thoroughly they simply buy and then want to sell higher and then they borrow money for not only they use their own funds but they use borrowed money also so as a result investors often end up making good returns, but speculators occasionally do, but they lose it all very soon. Yes. So my point is, you should try to be on the investor landscape and not on the speculator side. Because speculation often ends in tears, right? As they say. Yes. So you guys already told me all these things. Why do we invest? Yes, we want returns. We want safety. Yes. Uh, Then this hedge against inflation, right? So in periods of inflation, we want us to beat the market. So, the, so what type of investments beat the market? I already uh, kind of went over those with you. We talked about real estate, but then real estate was not liquid. Yeah, we talked about gold. Yes, gold is a hedge against inflation, but gold doesn't give very good returns all the time. Gold is a good diversity. In fact, right now, I think gold will do better than most of the stock market and risky assets the next three to five years. So gold from period to period, what happens is stocks suddenly go up a lot and gold doesn't do anything for two or three years. And that is the time like right now, when the environment is a little risky, when growth is probably slowing down, yes, to look at gold as an investment. Okay. So, how do we use this information to our advantage? So one of the things that people say is that we should create a diversified portfolio. It is not just creating something, buying something, holding and expecting it to go up, but have targets, right? So if you analyze your investments, know their value, yes, understand their value, create some diversification. One of the things that uh, is very true in the stock market, you, you would have heard of don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yes, same concept applies to investments as well. And from periodically, you have to check. Remember, setting target is fine, but are we meeting those targets? So for that, we will look at this uh, portfolio evaluation. Consistently look and see if our returns are matching our expectations. So that is all part of the investment process. Okay. Okay. So we agree that common stocks give you a benefit. Yes. So two things common stocks give you. What do they? They give you return and income. Yeah, return from appreciation. Income from dividends. Yes. And most often they're not we discussed Sensex and Nifty's case, yes, of beating inflation, right? So we said that 15%, uh, almost 14 to 15% over a 40-year period is pretty good, right, of consistently beating inflation. So that's uh, 
that's uh, possible only in the stock market long run yes long run okay now you all know what debentures and bonds are right bonds are government issue debentures are corporate issue remember when i'm talking about an investment portfolio i need two components i cannot just buy stocks because they are beating inflation and sit quiet why is that yes why is that students can i just put all my money in stocks and sit quiet yes no what do you think no because there is risk involved remember it is not just about returns risk now stocks are your high risk part of the portfolio bonds are the lower risk part of the portfolio so we need a balance so ideally they say if you look at the life cycle of an investor you want to put your age in bonds and 100 minus your age in risky investments so if you are 25 years old 25% of the investment should be low risk 75% of the investment should be in high risk please remember this age based asset allocation okay so this is called life cycle in this so if i become older and you reach my age 50 then what will you do you will move some of the stocks into bonds and make it 50 50 50 in less risky 50 why should you do this you don't have to do it every year but every five years you should do this why should you do this why is that when i'm 75 years old if i have all my money in stocks and a recession comes and it crashes i lose everything right Yes, it can happen. So I should be diversified. So bonds also have a very, very, very important place in the portfolio. And of course, you need some amount in cash. Why do you need some amount in cash always? At least 5 to 10% of the portfolio should always be kept in cash. Why is that? So to average it out when it dips. Yeah, yeah. So two things. One, in case you want to withdraw some money for personal use, yes. Number two, if prices crash, you want to have money ready to buy. And prices can crash every now and then, as we've seen, numerical, numerous amount of times. Share prices can go down too and stay down. So that is why the SIP, you would have heard of an SIP? Yes, students, SIP you would have heard, Systematic Investment Plan. Never make lump sum investments in the stock market because neither you nor I am good at timing. There are many guys who say they time and they all lose money. Yes, so what are we supposed to do then? So best thing is do systematic investment. Divide. Let's say you have 1 crore capital or 12 crore capital. Never make 12 crore capital worth of investment right now. Divide it by 12 and in each month invest 1 crore. So what are you trying to do there? So you're trying to average out the price. If the price crashes a lot, I buy more shares. If the price doesn't crash, I buy less shares. So within this 1 crore every month, you put 30% in bonds, 70% in shares. Now you have a diversified portfolio and you build wealth systematically over time and you don't listen to TV, CNBC, all those things. People giving you advice to buy or sell or do this or that. You just make money systematically over time. So are there avenues for you to do that? Yes, the NPS, the National Pension Scheme, does that for you. I suggest that many of you who are going to join the workforce, look at the NPS. It automatically does your, an SIP with your NPS amount. So it's a very good way to go and you don't see that money till retirement. Just because you know about the markets, it doesn't mean you can make money. So you have to be systematic. And this is called rupee cost averaging. The SIP technique is called rupee cost averaging, where you average out your investments over time. 
okay okay now uh, there are many types of bonds we won't get into much of this uh, there are floating rate bonds too today uh, floating rate bonds are those where the interest rate varies yeah. and most of the bonds in fact the, all the bonds issued by the government are in a zero coupon format okay what is a zero coupon bond You've heard of that, student? Zero coupon? Have you had the SAPM subject? Yeah, 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 yeah. correct. So they are issued at deep discount, redeemable at face value. So no interest is paid. Yes. So today all the government bonds are issued in zero coupon. The RBI, when it issues bonds on behalf of the government, is issuing it in zero coupon form. Okay. Yeah. So, so many bonds are there, you can choose. Yes. But in general, fixed income is the lower, uh, less in, uh, risky part of the portfolio. Very, very important. Why? Because you will get fixed income from it. You will get coupons. Yes. Interest rate is periodically paid to you. Now, when you are close to retirement, you want more of fixed income and less of stuff. And when you are very close to retirement, keep all your money in cash and fixed income. So you don't have any problems if the market moves down. Okay, students, I'll give you one or two minutes for questions on anything discussed so far before I proceed. Any particular questions you have? These are just the basics. I'm walking you through before we do some activities and some things, maybe tomorrow or maybe the second half. Anything you want more clarity on? Any Anything discussed? Okay. All right. Okay. So today, uh, newspapers, bulletins, these are all giving you a lot of information. Today, the internet has revolutionized the way information. Has, in fact, all investment the investors have same access to in the, uh, in information. Before, that was not the case, right? News wouldn't come out this much in the open. Today, NSC and the SEBI, the regulator, requires all information to be released at the same time on the exchanges. So, uh, if somebody is making money with information that is not there, is it allowed? They only know the information, you don't. Is it possible? Is it allowed? Yes, students, is it allowed? No, sir. Yeah, what do you call that? So it's inside called inside. Trip. Yeah, go ahead. Amol, go ahead. Yeah, insider trading. Yes. So insider trading is not allowed. Though every now and then you do see evidence of insider trading. Yes. So technically it is not allowed. Yes. So... So today, information should be released to all investors at the same time. And sometimes, who, who has insider information? Employees of companies, management of companies, yes, analysts who talk to companies. Yes, these are all guys who have uh, insider uh, information. And sometimes they give this information to their friends and ask them to trade. Even the government, finance, ministry, officials. Yes, they are all sources of information. Central bank. Recently, do you guys follow the news 
on how three Federal Reserve governors resigned. Yes, in the US, there were two Federal Reserve governors, one by name Ro Rosenberg, yes, and the other I forget, but they have recently resigned. Why? They were trading in the market and making money. Imagine that. People in the Central Bank of the US, in fact, the vice president himself has been caught trading now. So they are all going to have to resign. But the highest officers in the country, in the central banks, have been trading. We don't know if it happens in India because it will never come out. In the US, it comes out immediately. Institutions, everybody find out. And if you look at Twitter, it's full of stories of these guys. Members of parliament have also been trading shares. So these guys have privileged information. Should they be allowed? No, right? So very interesting, right? So uh, in investment information should be open to everybody and everybody should should have fair dealing. Otherwise, uh, what's the point? Okay. Now, okay, we already discussed all of this. Any questions, students, on what I have talked? So that will bring us to the next important thing, knowing the basics. Uh, we will do a lot of activities on fundamental analysis. So today, the great investors of our time, Warren Buffett, Junjunwala, are exclusively doing this type of analysis. And this is why I think you should master this. If you are looking for an equity research profile or a, a financial analyst profile related to stock market stuff, you must master this, right? So fundamental analysis is the basis of anything. In fact, those of you who are trading, simply don't look at the graph. If there is no fundamental reason for buying a share, you should not buy it. Okay? Before you look at any investment, think of a fundamental reason to buy. If there is a fundamental reason, I will give you this example, the power stocks in India right now. Is there a fundamental reason to buy them? What do you think? There is a fundamental reason. There is a worldwide power shortage. And I'm told we have only four weeks worth of coal supplies left. So that is a good reason. You, you are seeing Coal India, NPPC, all these companies go through the roof recently, almost giving 30% returns in two weeks. Why is that power shop? So there is a supply demand demographic there to look at. So you have a fundamental reason. Then you analyze using graph, more and a fundamental analysis. So fundamental analysis looks at why we have to buy a company? What value does it have? If you understand the intrinsic value of that company, then we can move on to other things. Yes? Okay. So, how do you do? Have you heard of sovereign funds, students? Any of you? There are many sovereign gold, uh, uh, sorry, sovereign funds globally. Saudi Arabia has a big fund, several funds in the US, Europe that are looking for returns and making investments globally. So fundamental analysis is basically done from three angles, okay? So it is called also EIC analysis, yes? So economy, industry, and company analysis. Yes? So that's uh, the basis for fundamental analysis. Students, uh, to do these uh, exercises and activities, you can make yourself into groups of 10. Uh, that would be better, I feel. So today at the end of the session, please uh, sit and make yourself into groups of 10. So you can do these activities in groups. So it will be a little easier and less time consuming. Yes. So for the next class, I request you to have groups and uh, one of you can do that or organize that. Okay, 
So very, very important now uh, to look at fundamental analysis because that's what global funds, fund managers, everyone is doing. First fundamental analysis, then everything else. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so when a sovereign fund is looking at um, investing, let's say Saudi Arabian fund, they want to invest some $2 billion. Are they going to give the money, put the money straight in one country? What will they do? So they will do this EIC analysis. First is economic analysis. What are we trying to do? We will compare all the economies globally. Yes, we will look at all the economies globally and see which economy is doing better than the others. Many people say that today the, one of the reasons that the Indian market is going up and some of the other markets are not going up is maybe India is having a very good uh, economic demographic. Yes. So sovereign funds will first look at all the economies and see which economies. So what are the parameters they're going to look at? You would have studied from your basic economics these. Yes, GDP, you know. Yes, uh, savings and investment. Each parameter is going to be evaluated for each one of those countries. And if they find a country with favorable parameters in most of these things, then they will shortlist that company. Okay, so that is economic. Then they will evaluate industries within that economy that they have shortlisted or economies. Sometimes funds may shortlist multiple economies. Okay. So they may like the demographics in several countries. So they may say, okay, so uh, what do they specifically look at? GDP, is the GDP going up? Is the trend upwards? Last five years, how GDP growth is? During COVID and periods, recessionary periods, how GDP growth is? How is savings and investment? So in India's case, GDP is recovering now. Yes, savings and investment has always remained high for India. That's a big advantage we have over many other countries. Inflation is starting to go up, but not very high. Interest rates are very low right now, the lowest in a decade for India, right? One year interest rates are only three and a half percent. That's uh, very, very good, right? Budget seems to be balanced. We are not running a very big current account deficit. Yeah. And tax structure is okay, not taxes are not too high. Okay. So this analysis is done for many countries. Okay. And uh, so, for example, let's take one parameter and see how India stacks up against everyone else. Have a look, students. So the leading economies in the world are in front of you. Nominal GDP wise, we are in fifth position. What is PPP? Adjusted GDP. In your international financial management, yes. Yes, Amol, yeah. Purchasing power parity, adjusted GDP. So that also, we, in that, if you look, we are actually doing better. We are in third position. GDP growth. We are in second position after China. But in the per capita, we are ranking way below. So now different funds may look at different aspects of this. Yes, and they may say, okay, I may pick up United States, India, China, etc. Yes. So this is just one metric, but so many metrics I showed you, right? So every one of them has different things. So when the sovereign fund is investing, they will Evaluate all parameters like this, subclass like GDP per capita, annual growth, all those things. Even look at how just the GDP alone is dissected into four different categories. Like that, they will look at several different components and decide to invest in one, two, or three countries. Yes? So this is the E analysis. So what are what what factors do we have to look at? When I look at GDP is one. Basically, there are many economic indicators you can look at. 
All right. So you can have something called leading indicators. Leading indicators, many say the stock market, the yield curve, uh, the shape of the yield curve. These are all yield indicators, but there are some very common, often heard of leading indicators. So leading indicators tell you what? They're going to tell you what's going to happen in the economy. Fiscal policy. If my fiscal policy is good, my economy is going to do well in the future. Monetary policy. Yes, if my monetary policy is good and I keep inflation under control, then my economy is going to do well. So it's going to tell you what's happening in the economy. Rainfall. How is rainfall a leading uh, indicator? Rainfall is Any idea? Yeah. So rainfall is has a direct bearing on agriculture. So if the monsoon is good, you'll have a good uh, bunch of crops. Pulses would be produced as a result. Prices of pulses and other uh, raw material inputs would be under control if there's a good monsoon. Otherwise, inflation will shoot up. If the monsoon is weak, we don't have adequate crop production, inflation will shoot up. Yes. Um, capital investment. If I have good capital investment, yes, then my economy is going to do well because I have made the right investments to keep the economy pumping. Because that, those are leading indicators. Yes. Coincidental indicators tell you the state of the economy as it is today. So GDP. If GDP is good, my economy is doing well. GDP is increasing. Industrial production is doing good, my economy is doing well right now. If interest rates are low, possibly my economy is doing well because inflation is under control and so on and so forth. So coincidental in, uh, indicators are telling you what is happening in the economy now. And then you have lagging indicators. So uh, Changes in the other indicators are reflected in these. So the economy does something because changes have already happened. So today the unemployment rate is, if the unemployment rate increases, it increases only because the economy is weak. So after happening, after the fact, these indicators will show the uh, changes, right? Consumer price index will go up if there is already inflation. Yes. And FII activity, if there is growth, then flow, if FII activity was there, then growth would happen. Sorry, capital movement, both FII and FII. Okay. So these are all indicators. So now many countries, okay, many countries have constructed indicators called diffusion indexes based on a combination of all these indicators. So you don't have to just look at all these indicators and compare and think, you just look at the diffusion index and see if it is trending up over time as a basis for economy. Right? So this is the E part in the economy. Students, is that clear? What the E part is, economic part. So Basically, we are understanding the economy from many different angles. We are looking at several indicators and to see. So if I compare Brazil, BRIC countries, for example, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, BRICS. Yeah. So I will compare all these indicators to see which country suits me. Yes. So sovereign funds and all these other uh, funds are looking to, in, in addition, very important to see not only how the economy is doing now, Five years from now, after I make my investments, how is the economy going to do? Yes. So there are a lot of uh, forecasting related uh, models, etc., that countries, uh, fund managers use that will tell them approximately, okay, this is the trend in which the Indian economy has grown over the last 10 years. We've had GDP growth increase steadily over the last 10 years. Savings rate steadily increased over the last few years. Inflation has been under control. Yes, so all these things are, uh, are very, very important. So let us take uh, GDP for example, students. Um, what do you think are the biggest risks to India's GDP today? 
in the next year, what do you think could be a risk? Unemployment rate? Now, why, why would you think unemployment would go up, you think? Any idea? Unemployment, yes, is a big risk to GDP at all times. Anything else that can impact GDP? Skill shortage, yes. Possible, yes. That is being addressed, but yes, could be. What about high oil prices? If oil prices keep going up, there are very high values. India is a net importer of oil, please don't forget. And that tends to impact a current account deficit. Yeah. So high oil prices could be one. Any global recession could be very easily impacted. We already saw how it impacted. Post-COVID, GDP fell nearly 23%, right? In one quarter, year over year. Recessionary imbalances, monetary policy changes. Yes, if the government. So far, so good. Yes, there is growth in low inflation. They call that goldly locks. You heard of the story of goldly locks? Any of you? So she was a girl who was very happily wandering around, and then what she ended up coming to, she found three bears. Yes. So, at, so it, it's very true in the stock market also. Yes. So every time you think Goldilocks is around, the economy is a Goldilocks uh, economy. Low growth, no inflation. Central bank has kept interest rates low for extended period of time. Be always aware of the three bears lurking in the shadows. Yes. Yeah. Any questions on this or any other topics, students? I'll throw open uh, the discussion for questions or any other interactions, specific questions on the economy or on investing, stock market related. We're going to get more into the details. When you do some activities, you will get a good feel for it. Uh, we are going to actually do a lot of stock selection based uh, activity. So before uh, we wind up, I, I want uh, definitely you guys to understand risks. Yes. So what type of risks are there out there? Yes. So there are two types of risks any company faces. Yes. You're aware of this. Have you had the SAPM subject? Not yet. Yes. So, yes. So, systematic. Okay. So, systematic and unsystematic. Perfect. So, what is systematic risk? So, systematic risk affects the whole system. Yes. It affects everybody. Can you diversify that? No. So, give some examples of systematic risk. Anyone? Inflation. Yeah, one of the biggest examples is inflation. Recessions are also, by the way, right now, should you be really worried about inflation is the question. Since you brought up inflation as a systematic risk. In fact, I think we should worry more about deflation. Inflation can be controlled by raising interest rates, uh, but deflation cannot be. Deflation is a complete erosion of purchasing power where pricing collapses, absolutely collapses. So deflation is a very big risk and it's a very big systematic risk. Yes? So you don't know when 
you can have a bout of systematic risk. When you have an unexpected, so uh, you all have uh, know the normal distribution curve, right, students? Yes. Okay. So, how many standard uh, deviations are captured under the normal distribution curve? Yes, students, anyone? If you draw the normal curve, the center line is the mean. It's about three. So today, when either an insurance company or anyone is hedging risk, they only hedge for three standard deviations. And that is covering over 99% of the normal curve. So should, we should be happy, right? But what about tail risk? Tail risk is the unexpected. Uh, please read the book, The Black Swan, to understand more about tail risk. So when the unexpected happen, happens, you can get a multi-standard deviation event. For example, earthquakes are six standard deviation event. Tsunami, seven standard de deviation event. Terror attack, eight standard deviation event. Recession of 2008, 13 standard deviation event. So how are you going to protect yourself? It's not possible for a 13 standard deviation even. When that happens, you get wiped out. But when periods of uh, economic boom are preceded by some change in trend and slowing growth, you get these unexpected events called black swans. The swan is what color? White, right? In fact, uh, I saw a black swan in Trovanda when I had gone to the zoo. Very rare to see it. Yeah, so these black swan events can happen. COVID was a black swan event. 40% of the stock market value came down in one month's time. So these unexpected events that you cannot account for, you should also have an idea. So Nicholas Talib in his book, The Black Swan, says, you must at least have some protection against tail risk, the unexpected that happens. Yes? Okay, students, with that, I will close the session for today, and I'm going to throw this open for questions. We will get more into the fundamental aspect tomorrow and the technical aspect as well. Your observations on anything and your uh, thought process. So black swan, you cannot be prepared for. So, but uh, what you can do is, in case you are worried about it, you can buy some long dated protection. So in India, it is very difficult to do that. Long dated put options are not very active in the market. So in case you are worried about that, out of the money, long dated options put options can protect you against risk. But see, tail risk doesn't happen all the time. But this is one of those periods where tail risk can happen. Why is that? The global economy is not all that well. The Federal Reserve may taper. It means they may reduce their asset purchases. Interest rates may go up globally. There are problems in China with their uh, real estate segment. You probably know about a company called Evergrande which has been in the news recently. Have you followed that? So they are a real estate developer who's borrowed a lot of money and not paid it back. They say it's even bigger than Lehman now. Uh, so, but that is all, that would classify as a gray swan. A black swan is something that you just don't see happen. It can happen out of no, nowhere. So given what has happened in the economy and how much slowdown, COVID was a black swan, now it has become a gray swan. The next COVID comes, people may be ready. But you never know.
Any other questions, students? Anything else you wanted to know? Anything we discussed? So another way I would look at the black swan is probably look at the opportunity that comes with it. If you are just having an SIP, if a black swan happens and 60% of the value comes down, you buy more. That's it. Ultimately, long run, things go up. That's why I say never do lump sum investments in the stock. It's a very risky proposition. Even during normal times, you get 10 to 15% corrections, let alone times like this. After 130% move in the market, it has proven that stocks will at least give back 20, 30% of that, right? So this year, market is already up again, right? So I wouldn't make lump sum investments now. That's asking for trouble. But the SIP, sure, why not? Keep going with that. Any other questions or insight you guys have? Yes, students. So shall I wind up the session then? If you guys have no questions. Um, yes, sir. So yeah. Yes. So I hope there are no questions in the. I, um, I will definitely share a recording of, I think you guys have the recording privileges. I don't. So yes, sir can share yes, the sir. recording. Uh, yeah. Recording is done, sir. Yeah. Uh, we we'll provide the recordings to the uh, participants. Okay. Um, I hope there are no questions in the chat box also, sir. I will, last, uh, let me, let me look at the chat. Yes, sir. The last question was, how can we be prepared for black swan events? Yeah, which I answered. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Uh, where is the chat here? Okay. Uh, good evening, sir. Yeah. So this is Ashita, sir. So we don't have any other questions on the chat box, sir. Okay. What I'm doing now, I'm just typing my mobile number in the chat. So um, in case you have any further questions, you feel free to WhatsApp me. Just tell me who you are so I can reply. Sure, sir. Yeah. Okay then students, thank you for your uh, time and thank you for participating in this. I uh, thank the, uh, I thank Shabari Shashtar and everyone at Christ University for giving me a chance to talk to you guys. And I uh, also want to thank my institute for giving me the necessary permissions to do this. So thank you, see you all uh, tomorrow. Thank, uh, you, sir. thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you once again, thank you, sir, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, sir, you are uh, mentioning something about uh, grouping, right? Uh, 10 students each in the group. Uh, yeah. Do you want that groupings during the session or like how, sir, they are, are you expecting some background work from the student before they uh, join the tomorrow session? Uh, no, not really, sir. I, I just okay. want to do when we are doing class activities, if okay, they sir. do it in a group, then it would be easy for them as opposed Perfect, to individually. Sir. Maybe uh, some kind of discussion if you're expecting. We have something called breakout sessions, sir. The option is yes. there. So we can create, uh, we can divide the entire student, uh, like 250 or 260 students in uh, the, the number, say 10 or 15, whatever it is. And we can have the discussion in group wise also. So we can give some time for them to interact and maybe discuss yes. and among the group members. And then they can, uh, like one or two present members can uh, wrap up this, uh, the discussions and all. Yes, sir, we can do that. Uh, as of now, you can just create the groups and keep them. Yeah, so, that we can do it in tomorrow or during the session itself, sir. 
Oh, it's easily easy. possible, sir. Yes, sir. it's okay, so easy, sir. sir. We have that okay, option sir. in the WebEx break, breakout sessions. We can create that. Okay. Sir. Okay, yes. sir. Because so I have no so idea much, of yes, WebEx because uh, more okay, family. So you you would know better, sir. Right, sir. Right, sir. So um, yeah. Uh, thank you uh, so much, sir, for accepting the invitation and for uh, present uh, for the wonderful presentation for day one. Uh, thank, thank you, you students. Right. So we can meet uh, tomorrow. Uh, and this link that we created is a recurring uh, meeting link. So you can just click on that again. You can join for the tomorrow also. There is no separate links are going to be created. The same link will be used for the tomorrow meeting session as well as the uh, 7th uh, October session too. So thank you once again. Uh, thank you, sir. And thank you all the students. Thank you. And in the meanwhile, if you have any doubts or any questions, follow on, you can message me via WhatsApp. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.